What is up, folks? Um, today we're going to be talking about some of the ways that I have slightly modified the Iviscope 1.5 times anamorphic adapter lens, uh, how I've been using it in my own personal workflow, and hopefully some of these things might help you. Uh, also, I share some tips if you are thinking about purchasing the Iviscope or on the fence about it, or you're just patiently awaiting its arrival because you've already ordered it. Just a heads up, this is the fourth generation of the 1.5 times Iviscope. There is now a fifth generation that's going to be coming out soon and it I believe they have even done better improvements on the helicoid now so that is really awesome uh, and also if you have a larger sensor they are going to be dropping a 1.75 times anamorphic adapter however the one I have is the fourth generation uh, because I bought it about a month before the fifth generation was announced so that is a little bit of a bummer however I'm not too butthurt about getting the 1.5 over the 1.75 because um, the, the Komodo has already a great preset for 1.5 times anamorphic adapter, but it does not have one for a 1.75 times. However, we'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, so yeah, if you're new here to the channel, I've already put out my first 48 hour tests using the Iviscope with a little set of Minolta records that I am currently building along with the red Komodo. And then not too long after that, I dropped a video uh, all about my first impressions using the Iviscope scope on a first real world shoot. So today we're just going to be sharing some tips on my setup because I have been getting a lot of questions about this bad boy not only here on the channel but also over on my Instagram. You can find me over there at Kid Tech uh, and also my little LLC production company is on there at Dog Times Productions. All right, so first up, let's talk about important deciding factors for when choosing taking lenses for the Iviscope. Because the rear element of this fourth generation is 38 millimeters, where all the previous generations were only 32 millimeters. However, the new 1.75 times IVA has a 40 millimeter rear element. However, do keep in mind that I am specifically talking about the size of the actual rear element, the glass, not the 52 millimeter thread that they all have. So no matter what generation you have, I'm pretty dang positive that they all have that 52 millimeter thread to be attached to any taking lens if you're into attaching it directly to the lens. If you saw my first impressions video, you know I'm not really a fan of that. I love the new 15 millimeter lightweight rod support system. Both the fourth and fifth gens come with this and I'm pretty dang sure the 1.75 times Iviscope comes with it as well. So Iviscope has slowly been enlarging that rear element with each new version. And that is a good thing because this 38 millimeter rear element can be limiting depending on what size taking lenses you're wanting to use. Because keep in mind that you're going to get better results with lenses that have a smaller footprint. And not just in their physical size, but also in their optical design. For example, my Zeiss Milvis lenses, uh, something like this I definitely would not recommend using with the Iviscope. The front elements are just really large and the Milvises are just way too dang heavy on their own to be using with something like this. I mean, you can see just how much larger the front optical element of the Milvis is compared to the little baby size of the rear of the Iviscope. We'll talk about that in a minute. So in my opinion, it's not really ideal to be pairing large lenses with this Iviscope because you have to keep in mind, it does weigh 700 grams all on its own. And just for a comparison that I think we all can identify with, keep in mind, that's about the same weight as a Sigma Art 18 to 35. So lighter taking lenses is something I would definitely lean towards. Not to mention the smaller the front element of your taking lens, the less edge fall off you'll have in your frame and sometimes even less light loss because the Iviscope anamorphic adapter does tend to eat up more light. So if you're out there hunting for taking lenses to be using with your Iviscope, I would definitely be leaning on those smaller designs. So with all of that in mind, the next thing to tackle for taking lenses is deciding on which focal lengths. So if you've seen my past videos on building lens sets such as my contact Zeiss or Milvis videos, then you are already well aware that I like to start every set I'm building with one uh, focal length that is essentially my standard lens. And typically for me in the spherical world, that's a 25, 28, or 35 millimeter lens. However, when building a set of anamorphic lenses, there is some math involved there when trying to translate those preferred focal lengths from spherical to anamorphic. 
And when referring to an anamorphic adapter, uh, such as something like this Ivascope, you may also want to consider the manufacturer's recommended taking focal lengths as well which for full frame, Ivascope recommends a 50 to 90 millimeter focal range for your taking lenses. But in Super 35 format, and more specifically the red Komodo sensor, that translates to roughly 37 to 66 millimeters. So to make my life easier, I reached out to the team at Artemis Pro and asked them about adding a 1.5 times anamorphic adapter to their viewfinder app. Because 1.5 times is not really a super popular anamorphic choice. However, in the Super 35 world, uh, in my opinion, it's kind of the sweet spot. So now Artemis Pro has the option to add a 1.5 times anamorphic extender to any set of focal lengths on any digital sensor. And that was definitely the number one way in helping me decide what focal lengths I would be choosing for when using the Iviscope on the red Komodo. Now, one tip in here for my Komodo users out there, if you wanna do this little trick, when you go in and choose the red Komodo 6K, you are going to wanna to make sure that you tap 6K 16 by nine, because when you're in anamorphic mode, it does uh, squeeze in on the sensor just a tad. To my understanding, I'm pretty sure that's correct. So then another thing is I just tap generic lenses, and then you just wanna go spherical, because you'll notice, the, the anamorphic options up front that Artemis offers is only 1.3, 1.8, and two times. So you're gonna have to hit generic spherical lenses, you build out your little set, and then you're gonna wanna tap right here where it says add extender. And you'll notice um, if you scroll down in the ISCO, it's under ISCO, and in there you'll see ISCO widescreen 2000 anamorphic 1.5 times adapter. A 1.5 times anamorphic adapter is a 1.5 times anamorphic adapter. It doesn't matter if it's ISCO or Iviscope. It's going to give you the same squeeze factor. And there you have it. And now uh, we are good to go. Here you can see what a 50 mil looks like in anamorphic mode on the red Komodo. And there's what a 35 would look like. And then if you wanted to go a little tighter, 60 mil, 90 mil. So you get the idea. That really came in clutch for me when I was building my set. Uh, now. Also, you know, by all means, you are more than free to reach beyond those recommended taking focal lengths. You know, just keep in mind that Iviscope is recommending those for a reason, and I would strongly uh, consider that because you have to keep in mind, if you're gonna go wider than the recommended taking focal length, you are probably going to experience some pretty heavy vignetting, and if you go tighter uh, on longer lenses than the recommended taking focal lengths, then you will probably experience some pretty significant softness in the image. So it, it was very important to me to stay within those recommended taking focal ranges. However, I did do the math to figure out what that would translate to for my specific camera and my specific sensor. And with the Komodo, you know, on its own, the Komodo has a 1.36 times crop factor, and I just divided that by those uh, full frame recommended focal lengths. You know, and again, for the Komodo guys out there, just know that it does translate roughly to about 37 to 66 millimeters. Now, obviously, if you're on a larger sensor, you are gonna have a little more options. Or if you wanted to use a speed booster, but in my opinion, I do believe that a speed booster is going to do more damage than good. You know, you're introducing another piece of glass in front of all that glass you already have stacked in front of your sensor. And uh, it may throw off your infinity focus as well. And I've already done an entire video on that, on uh, stacking lens adapters and issues with that. You know, the best, optimal results when using an, an anamorphic adapter like this is your taking lens needs to live at that infinity focus and so you want to make sure that that you're nailing that really really strong right off the bat but ultimately the choices of focal lengths is going to be different for uh, every person to person because it, you know it, it, it all boils down to two important factors your specific camera's crop factor and the aspect ratio that you plan on delivering your final project in now the Komodo makes this really easy because in anamorphic mode, it has a lot of presets for anamorphic options. So I just use the 1.5 times anamorphic shooting mode and it de-squeezes it right then and there in camera and even sends it downstream via SDI. And the best part is it bakes the de-squeeze into the raw data. Now, I imagine a lot of guys may not like this for you know a plethora of different reasons, but for me, I actually really enjoyed it because me being new to anamorphics, it just made my life that much easier on the post side. 
And also I am a huge fan of capturing the frame on the day exactly how I want it to be. I hate it when directors push in and reframe my shots. That's actually one of the biggest downsides of shooting on a high res camera and then turning around and delivering in 1080p. So I love baking in the bars even when I'm in spherical mode. So what I usually do is shoot uh, in the 2.4 aspect ratio when I'm in spherical mode and that makes it a little harder for the directors to you know punch in and, and reframe my shots. I mean I always have a conversation with the directors ahead of time regarding aspect ratio obviously but I would say about 80% of the time they either don't have a preference or they just straight up don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. So again, if you're sitting around waiting for your Iviscope to arrive or you're perusing the internet trying to decide what focal lengths would work, if you're not on full frame, then just divide your camera's crop sensor by those recommended taking focal lengths. And then just use Artemis Pro with that 1.5 times extender option. Because again, it is going to be pretty different for every other person depending on your own particular setup. So, I mean, obviously you could just buy a bunch of random ass lenses, However, you know, someone like me, I was trying my best to build a, a somewhat matched set of lenses, uh, but also trying to make sure that, that they would be able to render their most optimal results. So I was doing some heavy research on lenses that were pre-80s and also, you know, fell into that focal range of 37 to 66 millimeters. And, you know, why pre-80s? Because, you know, to me, anamorphic has a certain style, a certain flavor. And you guys know, normally I don't reach for funky lenses as a whole reason why I own the Zeiss Milvas. But when it comes to anamorphic, that's where I really want to embrace the weirdness. You know, I wanna lean into the strange a little bit, you know, because to me, that's the whole point of anamorphic, you know, in my opinion. You know, one of my favorite shows right now, it's on HBO, it's called The Landscapers. Man, they have some wild ass uh, anamorphic lenses on that show and, and that's what I like. Not a lot of people are into that, but to me it's like, yeah, if we're gonna do anamorphic, we should do it, we should do it right, <laughs> you know? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I steered clear of like the Surus and the Great Joys. They just looked way too modern in my opinion it, it, to the point where is that just like a streak blue filter on the lens? You know, you know, it, that's just my opinion. You know, a lot of people think I jump around and, and I'm inconsistent. I change my mind all the time. Yeah, I'm a creator. We should always be changing it up. We should always be experimenting. We should always be trying out new stuff. So I don't want to, you know, throw anybody off course here, but um, I was just saying that's specifically why I was choosing lenses that were pre-80s, because I really wanted to embrace that anamorphic look. I wanted to go hog wild, pretty much. And so that's ultimately what led me to the little Minolta Records. And I started my set with this little baby 45 mil F2 lens. And I absolutely love it. I mean, this thing is sweet. Not only the size, I mean, look how well this thing pairs with the Iviscope, right? I mean, look at that. It's such a little baby. It is tack sharp at wide open. It is an F2. This particular one is an MD Mark II. It came out in 1978. I'm gonna be doing a full on Minolta Record lens buying guide, so I'm not gonna go down this rabbit hole right now, but I do wanna say that personally, uh, I, I would strongly recommend hitting that subscribe button if you're new here, tap that notification bell so you'll know as soon as the video drops, because I've been doing so much research on the Minolta lenses. I've been buying and selling, testing, testing like crazy, and uh, finding some really cool lenses and there is a lot of Minolta history there a lot of Minolta uh, Leica history okay so it gets even more interesting so I cannot wait to drop that video for you guys uh, because it's it's just insane but I will say the biggest thing for me when researching and looking at the Minolta lenses is I love the way they render the out-of-focus areas the out-of-focus areas are so like you can, it's like brush strokes. It, the, the image quality of the Minolta records, specifically the ones from the 70s, have a wonderful, beautiful painterly quality. I absolutely loved it. And I thought, man, they are gonna go so good with the Iviscope. And, and they didn't prove me wrong, man. This was the first little lens I got, real cool little kind of UFO orb flares. And, and it just pairs so well with the Iviscope. But again, we're, I'm not gonna go down anymore about the Minoltas, I, I just, I could talk about them all day. We just need to get back on course here and talk about my tips and tricks for using the Iviscope scope on real world shoots. So there is a little bit of little mods, I guess you could say, that I use with my Iviscope that just makes my life easier when working with it on set. And also some of the things I've done also helps protect the glass of the Iviscope as well. So the front glass element of the Iviscope itself 
sits very, very close to the edge of the barrel. And because I spent a significant amount of money on this lens, I just didn't wanna take any chances getting it scratched. So what I ended up getting is a really good, uh, super slim 82 millimeter uh, clear filter, just an optical flat. It's a really well-made one from B&W. And being a B&W uh, filter, it is nano-coated, which, you know, is just extra protection. And it just lives on here. And because it's so well-made and so thin, uh, I don't have any issues with it. And the cool thing is, I can still use the little Ivascope cap to just put it right on there. Now you could always use a UV filter on the front too, but those have been known to interfere with your flares and not always in a good way. So when I first got the Ivascope, I was um, experimenting with different filters on the front uh, to, to help with protection primarily, but I also thought, man, let's see what it does to the image. And at first I used a quarter Hollywood Black Magic, um, and that dirtied up the bokeh way too much. And then I picked up a quarter Digital Diffusion. And the primary reason for that was because Digital Diffusion is probably the most subtle diffusion filter on the market. It's so subtle you can't even notice it, especially a quarter. However, it, it, the Tiffin filters are not slim, so sometimes it was vignetting specifically with the 35 millimeter lens, and even more so than how bad that 35 millimeter vignettes on its own. Because remember, uh, you know, the, the recommended taking lengths for the Komodo starts at 37, so the 35 does tend to vignette, especially if I'm trying to focus, like uh, a close focus with it. Um, so I, I don't really rely on the 35 millimeter too much. Um, I mean, I still use it, especially in big wide uh, shots, more so like exteriors and stuff like that. Um, uh, but it does vignette, so yeah, I, I try to stay away from it. So again, just another reason why I recommend sticking to those uh, recommended taking focal lengths from the Ivascope website. Now the biggest thing I was toiling over while awaiting for the Ivascope's arrival was how am I gonna use it when swapping lenses on set? Because you know, this option of screwing directly into the taking lens, I mean, when you look at the size of this little baby Minolta, no way. I'm never gonna put this much weight on the front of this little tiny lens. So I knew that was never gonna be an option for me. And because again, like everything I said in the beginning of this video, uh, all the majority of the taking lenses I got are nice tiny lenses because of that smaller footprint, optimal results, less edge fall off, less light loss, everything we just talked about, right? So I knew I was going to be living uh, on 15 millimeter rods with this awesome new LWS system. Now I know I've already talked about the LWS in my first impressions video, but now we're finally going to get into what I did to help me out on set. So as you all know, the biggest trick is how can we get the Ivascope as close as possible to the taking lens and then also allowing no light to leak in, but still be able to quickly swap lenses. So I started looking really hard at this rear 52 millimeter thread. Now that is a male thread because remember it's designed to screw into the front of your taking lens. And I knew I wanted two things on the back of this Ivascope. I needed a way to completely encompass the front of the taking lens, but also was thinking about a, a nice easy way to protect the rear glass when in transport. And the solution is really rather simple. It's this little 52 millimeter coupler. So with this, I can attach the Ivascope on one side and a big 52 to 80 millimeter cine step up ring on the other side. Now, if you're using small taking lenses like I am, this works awesome because you just push it back and it just covers the lens perfectly. Now, if you're using larger lenses, that have you know front elements larger than this 80 millimeter outer diameter ring, then you know you could probably reach for bigger cine step up rings if you absolutely wanted to. You know they also make them 95 and even 114. Um, however, again, I cannot stress you probably want to stay to smaller optical footprints for those taking lenses. And this is just another great reason why. Now here again, this is another uh, probably uh, reason why you want to have your entire camera living on a base plate system that was made for your camera and therefore sits at the exact height of your lens. Uh, but however, I do may have a workaround for that as well because a lot of people have been talking about they thought it was really um, 
you know, a bummer that Iviscope didn't make this adjustable. So, you know, for people out there that don't have their camera sitting on a standard sized base plate, so everything sits at the exact height. But I'll talk about that in a minute. But what I love about this little system is that I can just slide it forward, swap out the takey lens, and just slide it right back. No issues whatsoever. And then at the end of the day, when we're wrapping out, since this is a standard cine ring, I just have my little uh, cap. You slap it on there and away you go. Now, the Cine ring that I use is a knurled grip one from Simod Lens, and that's really because it's one of the very few Cine rings out there that you can get that doesn't have a company's logo or brand uh, all over it. <laughs> and plus it looks cool because it's that knurled grip, honeycomb, you know? You know, and that's the system I use. I have been using it. I've done uh, a few different shoots now with it, and yeah, it just works flawlessly. Uh, for the front end for matte box, I just have a bright tangerine uh, misfit with the rubber donut, and that works perfect. There is a little bit of a trick to the rubber donut, though. You're gonna wanna put the rubber donut on the lens first, and then bring your matte box up to the lens and clamp the rubber donut into the matte box. That is how I used the rubber donut. Before I used it like that, I used to try to leave the rubber donut on the actual matte box and then try to like pull the donut around the lens. That to me is a big pain in the ass. So something easier, I just pop the rubber donut out of the back of the bright tangerine matte box. I pull it over the lens. And then again, like I said, bring the matte box towards you, shove the rubber donut into the mat you know, and then and then twist it, lock it down. And uh, that's just a way easier way to use that black hole from Bl Bright Tangerine, um, you know, because because it's pretty it's pretty taut. Um, and, it, and I've never had a good experience with it until I started just putting it around the lens itself. But you are gonna wanna be careful about that. You're gonna wanna make sure that you're just, you know, you don't wanna pull it, because if you notice here how far the iviscope extends, you don't want it like pulled all the way around here, because then you're gonna limit your focus, right? You just want it living, because that rubber donut is so tight, the black hole, the one Bright Tangerine makes, it's so tight, I would just put it like right here. So it's just sucking right onto the, the, the front of this portion of the front uh, barrel here. Don't let it go beyond and get down into here or you're gonna have issues pulling focus. Now I can't really talk about anamorphic and share tips without talking about diopters. Now there's obviously budget options out there. I mean, I've had this four set of Vivitar diopters it was since way before I ever even heard about the Iviscope. Um, so, you know, it's possible that you have a set of these as well. They're already 82 millimeters. So that works out perfect because the front of the Iviscope does accept 82 millimeter filters. Um, and I think I'd pay like 45 bucks for this entire set. Now, the Iviscope does have pretty decent close focusing on its own without any diopters whatsoever. It, it can get about 30 and a half inches close focus on its own. But every shooting scenario is different and you may want to get closer than that depending on your location. And it's possible that you may end up struggling getting a close-up shot on that really wide anamorphic frame. But something I learned from the Anamorphics on a Budget YouTube channel is that you can really benefit from a plus half diopter. Now this took me a minute to comprehend, but what's really cool about a plus 0.5 diopter is that it allows you to get closer without disrupting your squeeze factor. Now Anamorphics on a Budget explains this much, much better. I'll leave a link to his video down below about this, but my basic cliff notes on it is that uh, the plus 0.5 gives you more flexibility and the biggest benefits of it is it keeps that close focusing distance more akin to the, the, the sphere uh, equivalence uh, a minimum focus distance. So what I'm trying to say here is that you can get a medium close-up shot using a plus 0.5 diopter and then when you go wider you can pop it off and your squeeze factor will remain consistent. Now the downside to all of this is plus half diopters are quite expensive and, and, a, and a little hard to find on the used market. However if you're balling on a budget like I am there are some workarounds to this. And I just happened to find a Tiffin 82 millimeter series nine plus 0.5 diopter on eBay. However, a series nine Tiffin filter, they do not have filter threads. But after, you know, starting a little discussion over there on the Anamorphic Shooters Facebook group, I quickly found out a way how I could uh, make that Series 9 plus 0.5 diopter usable in my situation. And this is really rather simple to do. You're just gonna need a couple tools. The first one is this $18 Amazon UV filter, a lens spanner wrench, and a blow dryer. 
I just blasted both the filters with the blow dryer and then with the spanner wrench, I was able to take both of them apart. I popped the UV filter out of the little frame from the Amazon UV filter and then took the plus 0.5 out of the series nine frame, dropped it into the UV filter frame and then you know put it all back together with the lens spanner wrench. And now I have a very nice uh, Tiffin plus 0.5 diopter with a really cool little uh, hipster retro leather pouch for under 150 bucks. Now, one thing I will add is that when you are shopping for the UV filter, if you wanna try this little hack yourself, I would definitely recommend getting the slimmest filter you can because you, know, you, you wanna make sure to avoid any vignetting issues. And you know, I do use this quite often, specifically with interior shots because this will allow you to get just that little bit tad closer, increasing your close focus by another like uh, six and a half inches, which in the grand scheme of things doesn't sound like a lot, but in practice, it actually is. So now the last thing I wanna talk about is that LWS system and how people were kind of bummed out that Iviscope didn't make this uh, rail clamp adjustable for different heights. So I do wanna point out that this is just connected with two quarter 20s. So you could easily just pop this off of here and find you a little rail block that is height adjustable. I know Small Rig has some out there. And yeah, just screw it to the top. It may be difficult depending on you know what you find. It may take some MacGyvering, but hey, where there's a will, there is a way. Or you could just save yourself the time and energy and just buy a base plate that was actually made for your camera. I don't understand what the issue is with that. You know, in my experience, as soon as I bought the eight sin base plate and riser plate that was made specifically for my red Komodo, all the issues that I had before regarding map box and follow focus and all that shit, it just went right out the window, folks, you know? So I know, you know, sometimes that first investment may be large, but man, I cannot stress enough in my experience, Buy large, buy once. That is it, man. You know, and, and, and I would like to point out too that, you know, I know not everyone is shooting on the red Komodo. And something I've realized coming from the Pocket 4K to the Komodo is that the accessories for the Pocket 4K were way cheaper than they are for the Komodo. So just keep that in mind too, you know, th these accessories really aren't as crazy priced as we first think they are because it may be a little more money up front, but it has saved me so much time and grief. And man, if you can save time when you are on set, to me, that is gold. Because something else, you know, in my experience, you don't wanna be finagling with stuff with clients over your shoulder and just directors standing around. You know, all that stuff, you know, it, it tends to increase your anxiety and, and it could cause you to, to not perform as good as you'd like to. So you just wanna make sure your gear is just super easy to work with, you're familiar with it, and you're just, you're just, you're just there on the day, you're chill, man. You can just focus on the, on the framing, the composition, the lighting, you can focus on what a cinematographer should be focused on and not, you know, finagling with gear or even if you have a first and second AC, they come up, you know, that you never want to attract that attention either on set when you have, you know, an AC come up to you talking about gear and then people start turning their heads. I don't like all that on set. I like everything to be super chill, you know. If I have notes to someone, I like to go up to them and just talk to them softly, you know. I don't like to, uh, you know, you know, I'm that kind of dude on set. I don't like a chaotic set and I don't like sets where uh, stress levels are going up because, you know, someone is saying something. Um, and, you know, and I was taught that by other professionals that I've worked with. You know, it just, you, you gotta be careful, you know, because everybody has ears and eyes on the set. And you know, you being a DP, they're gonna be, they're gonna be looking and hearing you a lot more than you realize. Now again, if you wanna really figure out who I am, we do something really cool over on the Dog Times Patreon. I put out an exclusive video every week. I take you on a behind the scenes virtual journey of all the jobs I do. I have, work, I have been working uh, full time as a freelance DP here in LA since 2018. And I've been working full time freelance as a gaffer <laughs> ever since January of last year. So. I'm working all the time here and I bring everybody on that journey and it is a very candid place. You know, I give, I share my experiences with all the, the stuff that I come into contact, not only as working as a gaffer or a DP on, on real sets out here on, on indie sets out here in LA, but also sharing my experience with just being a freelancer, having an LLC for the past few years, you know, just things that I come into, uh, into contact with. And then we talk about it on, on, on not only in the Patreon, but also on our little private discord chat. And also, you know, I, I'm the real deal. So a lot of 
companies, you know, they see me as a wild card. I'm a firecracker. I'm a fire starter. You know, I'm a little bit of a, I don't care about the companies. So, you know, I'm here for the people. So uh, I intimidate a lot of companies. I, I think I weird them out. So I, you know, I don't get hit up for sponsorships. So the Patreon is really the bloodline that keeps this channel going. And with that being said, I want to give a shout out to the producers of our Dog Times Patreon tier, uh, Fred Parr and Mike Skinner. Uh, and, and obviously, thank you to all of my Dog Times Patreon supporters. It, just, it doesn't matter even if you're only given a dollar, you know, you, you're helping it out. You, you, you are, uh, you, you're, you're keeping the, the dream alive, right? So, uh, it, but either way, you don't have to be on the Patreon because I do stay pretty, I, I try to stay consistent with putting out videos here on the YouTube, even even when things are getting a little heavy on the job side. So thank you for, for being subscribed to the channel. Obviously, thank you for the support. And uh, yeah, I appreciate all the feedback and, and I love a mature conversation, you know? Um, so yeah. As always, uh, we'll see you in the next one. That's a big, fat, motherfucking rap. Oh yeah, my dudes. Here's all the little Minoltas I've been collecting and testing. I cannot wait to show you guys the Minolta Record lens buying guide I've been working on. Uh, there's some gems in here, man. There are some freaking gems. Uh, and yeah, like I said, I'm still sticking with the Nova Flex. I am no longer converting my lenses to EF. I really do think EF is going to be phased out and, uh, you know, to each their own. I mean, I don't even have an EF camera, so what do I care anymore? Obviously, I'm going to keep the Kipper tie for my Milvises that have already been converted. But yeah, these Minoltas and... Uh-oh, you guys stuck around for the Easter egg. Uh-oh. <gasps> what is that?